Hi everyone. So, as web is growing in both complexity and size, more core, more core business systems are actually becoming the web itself. I think that the time of a simple CMS, content management system, or a web shop is behind us. Does anybody remember the good old days when this is the normal way of ri writing PHP, where you put template, database, logic, all into one file. <coughs> so we tend to call that spaghetti code. <coughs> but for lots of old school developers, this they think, they thought, but they also still think this was good enough. And if you don't trust me, 84% of web still runs that. Then we started with something like MVC, doing CRUD. But as complexity keeps increasing and increasing, we, we just can't use the same practices anymore. For me, sometimes trying to put a new feature in feels like trying to push an elephant into a really, really small room that wasn't supposed to have anything in it. I really got tired of having to explain to my colleagues, my customers, my clients, my team, team owners that I have no idea why did that bug happened. Even after I was log grabbing through logs for like two hours to just find out that stuff is not logged. So I have no idea what happened there. Or when I have to join five tables to get a list of po most popular articles, users, whatever, products. Why don't we, instead of looking for data, why don't we create it? So, on the other hand, instead of logging, why don't we build state from all of these changes and create data sources for each purpose? By doing this, we can easily separate the business complexity, the problem that we are trying to solve, with scalability. So let's say that, we're that our product is yet another issue tracker. It has an ID, it has a title, it has who is assigned to it, if it's an open, is it a bug, some kind of urgency and things like that. Can somebody tell me from this data, how long has this bug been open? And how can it be that no one is assigned to it? Like we have an urgent bug that nobody's assigned to. So let's check the logs. Issue was opened last year. Issue was closed last year. Issue was reopened somewhere this year. So we're missing details now. We're missing what happened. How could have this had happened? So let's add logging when something and when something else. And then we find another place where we forgot to add logging. But what if we actually record all the changes? Can somebody tell me how long has now this issue been opened? Anyone? So these are the events that happened there. The issue was created. We have some kind of an ID, a title, some kind of description. Then somebody was assigned to it. A priority changed. Somebody then actually changed the title into something that makes sense. Somebody removed themselves as assignment. They closed the issue and they reopened it today. And that's how you get an urgent bug that no one is assigned to. What if we create the state, that first state from these events? That's the idea of the event sourcing. Nothing more, nothing less. You record the changes and bring out the state from applying those changes. <coughs> so now we have the whole domain. Everything that's happening, all of our business problems are now located in this one small box. But that's not used for reading. That's only for writing. We only do changes there. So we need some way to get those, that data back to our application. What we usually do is create read sites. So <coughs> if it's really important for our product to have the number of issues that was open today, 
just create a small table or Redis uh, key value. They'll say today this number of open issues. Instead of select everything from issue where this is the state, this is the, these are the values. So instead of looking for data, let's create the data. We can do the same thing for already existing events when we need to recreate that data. That's called replaying it. We maybe want to know only the IDs of opened urgent issues. So if somebody opens an urgent issue, we put an ID into that list. If somebody makes an open issue from normal to urgent, we add it there. If it's closed, we just remove the ID. That's the whole idea. But this way, when you build custom read models, you can easily know the number of issues that were reopened this month or number of closed issues from the last year. You don't have to look through the data. You create it. And that's the idea of command query responsibility segregation. <coughs> so my name is Mero Svartan. I work as a senior developer in TicketSwap. I'm also one of the organizers of Zagreb PHP user group. And on Twitter, you can find me with this strange handle. I'm not going to pronounce it. So, actually, before, any experience with event sourcing and CQRS? Anyone? OK, quite nice. Any experience of knowing what event sourcing and CQRS is? Who knows what it is? OK, nice. So, I have a few projects running CQR event sourcing and CQRS. One of them was a part of TicketSwap product. So, yes. While the whole application is not event sourced, you can build just one feature to be event sourced. And then just connect it to the other things. The whole system doesn't have to run on event sourcing as CQRS. What it actually does, it imports some external data for some concerts that we have. And there's an admin flow for one of our for one of our teams to match them to our concerts. I'm not going into details, but just trying to explain that on one side we use it for external things, but we also use it in the normal user flow. Project X, I don't want to get into details of what it is, but version 2 was built using full event sourcing at CQRS. But the version 1 had a lot of what happened issues, and that's why I decided to use it as a test ground to go full blast event sourcing at CQRS just to know when it makes sense, when it doesn't make sense. Even when I knew it doesn't make sense, I really wanted to go all the way. There's another project. It's my pet project. I'm trying to track my GitHub builds just to have a small dashboard showing me the state of my pull, pull request. And version 1 had a lot of existence issues. And version 2 is now going full event sourcing and CQRS. And what do I mean by existence issues? So most of my data I get from a GitHub webhook. So when I get the hook, I get the branch name, I get the commit, I get some author details. But I, have, I had to check if the branch already existed. If it not, create one. If the commit exists, no, create one. If an author exists, go create one. But actually, a branch needs a last commit, and commit needs an author. So actually, this goes the other way around. So first do the author, then commit, then branch. So when you're thinking as in the sense of objects and relations, you have a branch entity, then you have a commit table with a commit entity, and then you have an author. Why? Because maybe on the other branch you have another, you have the same commit. Or on some other branch you have another commit that has an author. But after rethinking it a bit, actually in my domain, in my problem, commit and author are just value objects. I don't care what the commit is, and I actually don't care who the author is. Because there, I don't care about the relationship of the branch commit and author. I don't care how it looks in the database. Because in the event sourced part, I was solving the domain part, not how it should be persisted. And I don't care how many commits 
did the author do? That's not important for that pet project of mine. So actually, what it now looks like is this. And if you tell me in CRUD to do something like this, if I was your team manager, I would probably fire you a year and a half ago. Because this goes out against the third normal form. Everybody knows what's a third normal form? The idea is don't have the same values in multiple places because if you change it on once, you have to, in one place, you have to change it everywhere. But here, those, ob those values are actually value objects. So if I'm going to give you 20 euros, do you care if it's this bill or that bill? No, it's a value. You just care that you can buy five beers for that 20 euros? I don't know the prices of beer here, sorry. <laughs> okay, so defining bounded context, I'm speaking from the side of I don't have the main expert. Uh, often my projects are the domain. I'm not trying to show, I'm not trying to do something that already exists in real life. And separation of bounded contexts is still a really, really hard thing for me to do. So let's say that you're a ticket swap user. So on our site, you can be just a user, but if you have some tickets to sell, you're also a seller. But you can ch maybe just buy tickets for sold out concert from somebody, or you just use some kind of notifications. So what is a bounded context here? Is it a user, buyer, seller, or is all of that one context? To be honest, I'm still trying to figure it out. In a boring domain, and by boring I mean enterprise, uh, domain experts will actually tell you what happens. Like if you're trying to buy a computer, you just go, it goes through supply office. You have to fill a request, somebody say, like your manager has to say okay, and then they just order it. Your paycheck, the amount you're going to get is probably calculated by human resources. If you want to pay raise, you talk to your team lead, your manager, they say okay, then HR does its magic. And both of those things will be paid by accounting. And CEO will get an expense report. So it's much easier to know what's a bounded context here, because I actually showed you four of them now. In the application that's coming to life or that doesn't have such good separation, it's hard to know where one bounded context starts, when one stops. So let's say that you're working in a startup. Airbnb for bicycles, whatever. Let's be honest, we don't know what we want or where the road will take us. We might try something new, and of course it has to be done yesterday. Anybody from the startup? Okay, few hands. Don't try event sourcing there. Try it for the things that you're sure that are not going to change. Because event sourcing is hard to do in a fast, at fast pace. Try to concentrate on bringing value, not perfect code. So actually that example, I don't plan to for now do it in TicketSwap. Why? First, it has unclear boundaries. I have no idea what are the boundaries of a buyer, of a seller, or a user. I don't want to go totally wrong direction because then fixing it is pretty hard. It's too deep into our core. I don't know future direction and actually existing code looks really okay and works really okay. And I'm guessing I'm gonna be sorry for this on Monday because I have already been sorry that some of these things are not even sourced when I have to tell somebody, hey, why is this phone not valid? So another thing is trying to separate the main application and the infrastructure. What we often start is who here works on multiple projects? Like, hey, we're an agency and we're going to do a new project for a client. Anybody? A few hands. 
Do you first start by saying, hey, we're going to do it in PHP using Symfony, Nginx, and MySQL? Well, exchange Symfony for a lot of well, MySQL for Mongo, whatever. But you define first the technology and then look at the problem. Then you try to design the ER model. Actually, what happens in a lot of cases is that you spend 80% of your project time on just 20% of the problem. Uh, you try to make your problem fit your solution. What you actually get is that you designed a house of cards. And maybe at that last 10%, last week or two, you start implementing the logic. The thing that somebody hired you to do. I've done it for more than a few years like that. So let's take an example. How many of you are saving invoices in a relational database? Is it, it, does it have a relation to a person or company? Or it's a document? Do you save all the info in that table? Or do you have this invoice belongs to this company? So what happens when a company changes address? And I want my five-year-old invoice because I lost it? You're going to send me an invoice with my new uh, address? That's actually against the law. Invoice is a document. But on the other hand, when Mongo became very popular, the idea was, well, we can put the whole blog post and all the comments in one entity and save it as one record in Mongo. But then you had another issue is, what if my, I change my name? How are you going to change all of my comments? Or I'm going to be Miro Svartan there, John Smith there, somebody else there. So we're trying to build entity with relations as a document because comments are related to a blog post. Comments are related to a user. They're not value objects in this case. So that separation is pretty hard. Why don't we, f let's say that we want, we are hired to do a site to play poker. Why don't we try to first solve the problem? Implement all the rules of poker first. Then say, hey, our application needs these data pieces. Let's create reads for that. And then let's store them in the best place for it. MySQL, Postgres, Redis, Elasticsearch, MongoDB. You pick. You can use all of them if they fit your data needs. OK. So sagas or process managers it's the idea of connecting the unbounded context, the aggregates. And what happens if the third out of five steps dies? Your first two bounded contexts are in valid state, but your application is not. So let's go back to that ticket swap example. Let's say that each of those were in a separate aggregate, a separate bounded context a user, a buyer, a seller. So when user registers, I create a saga that listens for an event that user was registered, and I create a buyer, create buyer uh, aggregate then. Do the same thing for a seller. But what if there's a bug when I'm creating a buyer? So neither buyer nor seller gets created. I have a user, but I don't have it as a buyer or a seller. That means that our application is currently broken. So why don't we use queues for that? They can be your best friends or worst enemies. Not or, and. So what you get is an isolation. Because if my saga is listening for those user register events, I just put both commands into a queue. And then if one fails, I can just retry it later when I fix the bug. But the second one still existed. Uh, who here is using any kinds of queues? OK. So do you have one queue per payload? So here, you don't have to use one queue per payload. You're using commands. So from queue 
so from the queued command bus to normal command bus, there's a worker inside. They'll just take a command and just throw it back to the command bus, the normal one. So it can help with the number of queues you have. But you can always use multiple queues and even workers. But be aware, I had really strange bugs because of it. Don't have multiple workers if you, can't ha if you can have concurrency issues on that aggregate on that same aggregate. Because if you try to run some command on the same aggregate in one worker and on the other one, the first one will be OK. The second one will get an error because it's, it was doing things on the old version of the aggregate. Sucks. I'll explain it a bit more with an example. If you don't have any kinds of concurrency issues, you can put hundreds of workers there. So as an example, so whenever I import those external concerts, I can put them in a queue that has 50 workers because I know there's no concurrency on one aggregate root since every external concert is an aggregate root for itself. But for the GitHub issues, if you're monitoring a popular open source uh, project, you can get 10 webhooks at the same time for the same project. If you try to run it with 10 workers, you're going to get a lot of errors. So I, what I had to do is, on those, put only one worker on a queue, but do sharding by the starting letter of the repository. So, uh, so Symfony goes to the queue with the letter S. It's not the fastest thing, but it's actually pretty good. Uh, queues also bring eventual consistency, because workers are async. So some changes might happen 10 minutes after the initial ones. Because queues can get clogged. In your application, well, actually in your application and domain, never, never, never blindly trust read model data. Use it as a information, but always in the aggregates, verify that it's OK. So let's say that we have a 15 minutes reservation to buy some kind of a product. We actually bought the product, but read side wasn't updated yet because that queue was clogged. If you blindly say delete the reservation, oh, you're going to be in trouble. Send delete if not reserved and put the logic into an aggregate that will check, hey, was this actually paid or is it still unreserved? Aggregates are the only source of truth. Never trust read models. Uh, now let's get back to the performance thing. Uh, loading events from a, the event store is actually blazing fast. Uh, serializing is really fast, and applying them is really fast. So usually, it, so usually your aggregate routes will have maybe 10 to 50 events. So to load that aggregate, it's going to take less than 20 milliseconds. So don't worry about the performance there. <coughs> you might have issues if, you, if on one aggregate route you have like 2,000 events or more. I actually have an example that was more proof of concept to look what's going to happen. So I have a big aggregate route on that project X. It has 700 entities inside and 580,000 events. I had to implement snapshotting very quickly because every time I tried to do a change, it would take seconds, seconds, tens of seconds, even minutes to load them. So what's the idea of snapshotting? Instead of replying, or replaying all events for performance reasons, record the state of aggregate at one point and save it somewhere. Then when next time you're loading your aggregate, load the snapshot, and just load all the events that came afterwards. I had to do it myself because Broadway, the framework that I'm using, doesn't support it. Proop, the other popular one, has a snapshot support. But it's a sim simple MySQL table. It has how to increment the aggregate ID, event number, and payload. I create a snapshot 
approximately every 200 events. But that payload is 17 megabytes of data. Because what I do is run the serialize on the object and just save it to the database. Yeah, yeah, I know, not the best solution. So about 1,000 snapshots takes about 17 gigabytes of data. And to be honest, I'm still too lazy to do automatic cleaning of the old ones. So I just come every few weeks and delete all the older snapshots. But my aggregate load time is under 100 milliseconds. Actually, it's about, it goes from 30 to 70, 80, depending on how many events were there after the snapshot. But with snapshotting, beware that if you're changing the aggregate, you'll have to delete all snapshots and maybe even manually generate snapshots for those big aggregate routes. But again, it's really, really uncommon to have more than maybe a few hundred events per one aggregate route. That was really, really me trying out a special thing. So having 580,000 is really a code smell. Try to avoid any logic on the read side. It should be anemic model. It should just have data in it. Nothing more than that. Any and putting any kind of logic there is actually a design smell. So let's say that you have an event that some pr that you have a pr defined price and price without with and without VAT. But in your application, you have to show the VAT amount or VAT percentage somewhere. Please don't calculate it on the read side. I've done it a few times. Bad idea. It's actually a design smell that we, that I or you haven't designed everything well. Who here does automated testing? Okay, almost everyone. The rest of you guys, I'm really sorry that I spent 30 minutes of your life because don't try event sourcing without testing experience. You really need it. Uh, when you're testing the aggregate route, don't test, test state. Never check the values inside the aggregate route. Always check the inputs and outputs. If I send this and this was the previous state because of those events, I expect this event to go out. Try to concentrate on the unit and integration testing. Do some end-to-end -end tests. Don't go overboard. Uh, when you're building, developing it, mock the whole infrastructure. Use in-memory repositories. Don't lock yourself to MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, or whatever. Use a simple in-memory cl repository class. It takes you three minutes to create one. And your tests will be 10 to 100 times faster. Because what you're trying to test is what's happening, not how it's persisted. Uh, I actually had to refactor the read side three weeks ago on, tic on the external concerts thing. And we stored, well, by we, me, stored it in Elasticsearch, which was a really, really bad idea. Because Elasticsearch is not a database. Because of lots of issues, I added lots of end-to-end -end tests. So. When we decided to drop the old Elasticsearch cluster, I refactored the whole read site to use Doctrine, ORM, and MySQL. It, it took me four to five hours. But then, updating tests took two days. Because I was so painfully trying to test every single case on the end-to-end -end that code was maybe a few thousand lines, but tests were few tens of thousands of lines long. So actually, how it's done. So we actually have all the events stored. We can easily replay all of them to fill up those new read models. It takes a 30-line PHP CLI command, nothing more than that. And for 16,000 events, it took less than one minute to regenerate the new read models. And we just turned off Elasticsearch. We were moving to a new cluster. So I took that as an opportunity to finally remove Elasticsearch from that part of the code. UIDs. Who's using UIDs? 
rest of you don't know about UUIDs or who doesn't know what the UUID is? Okay, so everybody knows. So instead of expecting your database to give you that the ID is going to be 347, commands and aggregates actually need you to provide the ID. Uh, I would suggest using Grimes's UUID library. It's really good and really nice to work with. But there are some performance issues. Because this is a UUID, it's a 32 char long string. Instead of just having one, two, three, four, five, it's going to take a lot more space. You can save some space by going uh, binary, but then your SQL clients are not going to be too happy with that because you'll see a bloop on your screen. Another thing is they're not continuous. So every time you add new item into the database, it might need to rebalance the indexes. And you also need the created add field because select everything from table sort by ID is not going to work anymore. They're not continuous. But one change that happened for me as a developer is that I have been now using UUIDs everywhere. I actually hate having few of the CRUD entities as uh, having auto increment because there are always pieces of logic where I have to check, hey, does this object already have an ID or not? Like try to think of putting a product ID into the slug when you're creating SEO stuff. Try to use familiar tech. Event sourcing in CQRS is a really, really big shift in thinking. Also, you have to start practicing some domain-driven design ideas. Uh, if you have experience, experience using MySQL, Mongo, XYZ, whatever technology, try to keep using it if you can. Don't force yourself into using it, but rather try to use it, because shifting the way and the tech is really complicated. One thing that's going to for sure happen is in a CRUD app, we're going to have a controller, an entity, and a read, and a repository. But in CQRS, event sourcing in CQRS, besides the controller, we have the command, the handler, the aggregate, the event, event projector, read entity, and read repository. So it does grow in number of classes, but don't get worried. They are actually really, really simple. This is just a data transfer object. This is just a data transfer object. Keep this anemic. Uh, this is where your logic is. This one and this one have usually one method, one if load from repository, call this command, and that's about it. So they're really simple to work with. I've had issues myself with, oh my god, now I have 55 classes for something that used to be free of them. Because every time you add a new feature, you have to add a command and an event for it. Uh, but let's remind ourselves that we now have the controller, the, en the entity, the repository, a template. But in that spaghetti days, it was all in one. Who's looking forward to good old spaghetti days? So let's not look at this as such a complicated thing. Look at the, it's the same. It does have more classes, but they are simplified. It's much easier to work them as, as, as it is moving from the spaghetti to the CRUD MVC app. Recap. Event sourcing and security is the best thing ever, literally. Thank you very much. <laughs> Unfortunately, I see we have 20 seconds, so no five. questions. Or we, uh, we have five minutes for questions. Oh, OK. My, my time is then wrong. Hi. Uh, what was the projector class that you mentioned? What was its responsibility? Uh, projector is listening for an event and then creates or updates the read entity. 
nothing more than that. Any more questions? Thanks. Uh, what is the framework of yours, of your choice? Uh, you talk about Broadway, or is it anything else? There's Broadway and there's Proop. I think that they both are good enough for anybody to pick up. Proop might be uh, more used, more alive than Broadway, because there's a company behind it and they are continuously evolving the whole project. But it's also moving really fast. So I think that the last versions expect PHP 7.1 and are locked to PHP 7.1 because they use return types. Uh, Broadway is still PHP 5 plus 7 compatible, so. Hi, since yesterday I'm hearing about UUID. I never used it. Uh, can you tell me if this is a problem of performance uh, of MySQL, if it, if you, if we are using a, a document ID, what what's the real uh, impact or benefits of using a UUID? Okay, the benefits are in your logic, because let's say that you have uh, you're creating a new article in WordPress or whatever, wherever blog post. You want to create a slug that has a title and the ID of the article of the blog post. You can't do it at the moment of first save because you don't have an ID. So what you have to do everywhere is first save the blog post, then get the ID, then create the slug, then save it again. This is a simple problem, but when you get into the domain or somewhere, some places where you have to have that ID but it doesn't exist, but you have to do something else, it gets really complicated. Uh, UIDs are just pre-generated IDs. On the performance side, they might give you some trouble if you are Facebook, if you are eBay, or something really, really, really big. But for normal sized or whatever we call big applications, I don't see that, that many issues with them. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, okay, thanks. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, I have a question about Teams and Secures. Uh, from your experience, is it an easy uh, task to mm, to introduce Secures to junior developer that comes to project? So, even sourcing or Secures? Uh, you okay, can let use it be one both of. One, you can use one without the other. Yeah, yeah. Okay, doesn't matter. So, in case uh, the architecture is already built, uh, is it easy to uh, join junior developer to the project. I think it is. Huh? I think it is. I think it's probably even easier to train a junior than a senior. Because let's be honest, at least I'm an old dog that doesn't want to learn new tricks. That's it. Oh, thank you again. Please leave me feedback here. And if you have any additional questions or you were too shy to ask something, I'm just going to be outside here probably smoking, so you can find me on the terrace. Thank you.